Let's give it up for our first time guests online and in person. Welcome, welcome, welcome um, to our guests who are here for the first time. We're so excited to see you. Uh, you need to know that you have been divinely set up before time ever began, before the Milky Way galaxy was flung into existence. The Lord has orchestrated events for you to be here to hear about King Jesus. So just know you've been set up. <laughs> Let's give a big welcome to the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility <laughs> partnerships throughout the Carolinas. And to the TC family, it is so, so good to see you guys. Uh, this ain't a part of my notes, but um, I'm just in a season of gratitude. And I want to thank you all so much for allowing me the privilege and the honor to serve you as one of your elder pastors. I don't take that lightly. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. It really, really means a lot. And so I kind of buttered you up a little bit because it's going to be a tough sermon. <laughs> I'm joking. So we're in our Lent series. So what in the world is Lent? So teenagers and young adults, Lent is a season in what's called a church calendar that Christians in Brazil and Fort Mill and China and Iran and Iraq uh, and downtown Charlotte and around the world, it's a 40-day season leading up to Easter. And Lent is a time of, number one, reflection, where we take inventory of how good God has been, as we take inventory of our disappointments, of our struggles. Um, it's also a time of recalibration, um, and we recalibrate by learning how to turn. The Greek word for repentance means to turn. Now, some of you have a church background, and repentance was preached to you uh, by somebody who looked like a fire-breathing dragon, and it was like this angry thing, when in actuality, repentance is a gift. Repentance is God in Christ through the Holy Spirit's power saying, you're walking out of alignment with my will. And where my will is, is where I am. And because I want you with me, I want you to turn around because with me is the fullness of life. With me is what you've been created for. Like, like we literally have a God who wants to be with us. Us. And so repentance is not something to fear, but a gift for us to embrace. And so this series of turn. So today we're going to learn how to turn from trying to relying. Matter of fact, I want you to say on the count of three, try and then rely. One, two, three, try, rely. So often for many of us, the way we follow Jesus is like this. Jesus, thank you for forgiveness. I got it from here. Uh, I'm going to overcome my anger. I'm going to overcome my trauma. I'm going to overcome my addiction. I'm going to overcome my sin. Jesus, I got this. I'm going to do it. And then what you find out is after you go through it for a while, you're, you're, you're frustrated. Like, but, but, but Jesus, I, I, just, I just can't get over this. I, I can't stop this. And, and I'm trying. I'm trying. I, I, I. And what happens is, is we put ourselves in what I call a spiritual eye chair. So babies are in high chairs. When we focus on I, we get in a I chair. And being in an I chair does not lead to change and deliverance. It leads to narcissism and self-obsession. So we need to get out of the I chair and say, Jesus, I can't do this, but I hear that you can. And I want to put you to the test. And he loves to be put to the test. He loves to defeat sin. He loves, loves, loves it. But here's the thing. He will deliver you from an enemy, not a friend. And sin is not your friend, nor is it my friend. But let me slow down just a wee bit. Let me ask us a question. Now, teenagers, young teenagers, preteens, young adults, this is a very important question. What is God's dream for your life? What is God's dream for your life? Now, before we answer that question, I want to throw a statement out. Uh, and I'm still, I'm talking to everybody, but I want to zero in on the preteens, the te teenagers, and young adults. Believe this or not, one day you're going to be a parent. I know it's hard for you to believe, 
And when your kids are acting up, your parents are going to laugh at you and say, how does it feel? They ain't even going to help you. They're going to be like, mm-hmm, how does it feel? Here's one way to mess up your future kids. Tell them they can be anything they want to be. Here's the reality. You cannot be anything you want to be. I cannot be anything I want to be. I know that flies in the face of all the toxic positivity, but if your son is 17 and four foot six and 100 pounds, he is not playing in the NFL. <laughs> it's not going to happen. If you want your child to be good at algebra, do not hire Pastor Derwin L. Gray to teach your child algebra. I went to Algebra 1 as a senior in high school. My son had Algebra 1 in seventh grade. If you want me to be the tutor, that child will be dumb. But you know what, though? There are some things that God created me to do. And by God's grace, I can discover that. So don't tell people they can be anything they want to be. Tell them you can be whatever God has created you to be. And it's beautiful and it's remarkable and it's tailored for you in your gift set. There's a lot of people who are angry. Listen, there's a lot of people who are depressed and angry because they didn't become what their mom or dad told them they could become. When we should have been saying, God, who do you want me to become? So what is God's dream for your life and my life? His dream is for you and I to reflect his glory into the world. It's to reflect his glory into the world. Well, what does that mean? Glory means the weight of something. God has created you and I to be, um, let me see. Um, do y always, y you guys may get this or not. Do you remember back in the day? We'd have the bikes with all the reflectors in the spokes, and at night they just reflect. Well, when we come to know Jesus, he wants us in the night to reflect his light. So whether if you teach school, whether you're a stay-at-home dad or mom, whether if you're an accountant, whether if you're a lawyer, whether if you're a doctor, whether if you're a sailor, regardless of whatever you are, he wants us to reflect his light in the world. So what you do professionally is not as important as what God does in you so you can reflect him through your profession. If you get those ordered messed up, your profession becomes your God. And by the way, when you and I reflect God's glory, that's when we are fully alive. My first five years in the NFL, I did not know Jesus. When I first retired from the NFL, people would ask me, do you miss it? And I would almost have this visceral reaction. And I was dealing with stuff. Sanctification or growing in Christ means you deal with disappointment, you deal with heartbreak. And my response would almost be like, I don't even want to talk about it because I remember for five years, I was so filled with anxiety. You will get fired in the NFL. I seen guys one week with a job, gone the next week. You will get fired the amount of pressure. And then I'm like, man, I'm hurt. So am I going to take this shot of Toradol? Because if I don't get in the game, this rookie here, he hungry. Well, you better shoot me up. I'm getting in the game. I'm going to play because I want to keep my job. And I got to keep my job because my family at home in Texas, they need money for me to send them. And if I don't play, then they lose self-esteem and value. Then I lose self-esteem. and Oh, man, it is. I was like, no, I don't miss playing. I bet some of you feel like that now. And you may be following Jesus. So he wants to reflect his glory. And when you and I reflect his glory, we're made alive. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Well, we've, we've actually never taught. I just kind of read his letters. He's a little bit older than me. Uh, he was born in 120 AD in Turkey. Uh, his name is Irenaeus. 
And uh, he died in about 202. So that's a long life for the ancient world. But um, he was a pastor in an area of the world called Gaul, G-A-U-L, which today we know as France. But back then, it wasn't France like we think. It wasn't like, bonjour, je m'appelle Jean-Claude. It wasn't that. You had people from all over that world that end up making what we now know as France, but you had people from Scotland and whatever, all those countries, right? So, but anyway, he was a pastor there. And one of the things that he's famous for is this phrase, and it's so true. The glory of God is man alive. So, so we have a father. We have the Lord Jesus. Listen now. We have God, the Holy Spirit, the very triune God, the Trinity himself, has a vested interest in you bringing him glory and me bringing him glory. It makes God smile when you and I are walking with him, when you and I are loving like him, when you and I are living in his grace. God is going, I want you to bring glory, not because I'm narcissistic, not because I need it. It's because you need it so you won't become narcissistic and self-obsessed. Check this out. We're going to lay a little foundation here. For those of you new to the faith, a guy by the name of Paul, who's a Jewish guy, wrote a letter to some churches in Turkey. These churches had people from all ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. And he says this to them. Since you heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Time out. How did they hear about Jesus? The same way people hear about Jesus to today, through Jesus' followers. My wife came to faith through a woman at work. I came to faith through a teammate at work. Who are the people at your job and your schools that you have an opportunity to tell about Jesus and invite them to Transformation Church? Now, I know what some of you are going to say. I got it. I'm preloaded, man. You're like, Pastor, but they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear from religious hypocrites. They don't want to hear from cultural warriors. They don't want to hear from modern-day Pharisees. Isn't it ironic, the very people who the Pharisees didn't want to talk to, they would sit down and talk to Jesus. So maybe the problem is, it's not that people don't want to hear. They just don't want to hear from jerks. They actually want to hear from people who are loving and kind and compassionate. How in the world can you change somebody's heart by yelling at them? Oh, that's right. In uh, chapter insane, verse 9, Jesus said, come here, you dirty, rotten sinners. No, it says he was a friend to sinners. And you know what the religious folks did? He's a drunkard and glutton. By the way, in the first century, second temple Jewish world, to be called a drunkard and glutton is to be called every cuss word and degrading thing you could ever be called. And you know what Jesus said? Bye, Felicia. (laughs) He had a mission to reach lost people. There's a lot of people who would listen to you. Share your heart with them. Share your story with them. Invite them into the house. Uh, Verse 22. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. So I'm going to explain this more in detail, but I want to touch it now because it's really important. Everybody who's ever born... It's born of what the Bible calls spiritually dead. That means we're isolated from God, separated from God. Uh, Another word for it is we are sinners. It means to miss the mark that all of us are born spiritually dead and we need to be reborn. Now, in our culture, people like Durham, what are you talking about? Can I give you just a simple illustration? Why is it that the first words of my kids and your kids are no and mine. Who taught them that? Think of it in this, this way. The child is in the mama's womb for free for nine months, <laughs> feeding from the umbilical cord, kicking her in the stomach, and in my wife's sense, making her sick for nine months. You come out in a very, very difficult process. Then you find yourself in a house you didn't pay for, Clothes you didn't buy, insurance you didn't get because you ain't got a job. And you got the nerve to go, no and mine. 
if that ain't enough proof, all we got to do, family, is turn on the TV. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole bunch about this because I'm not very, I'm hopeful in Jesus, but I'm not hopeful for America as it pertains to gun violence. I remember 1996, Columbine. We're like, this is so unreal. This could never happen again. And so this is what happens. One side goes, hey, Second Amendment. That's in the Constitution. Second Amendment is true. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't, I don't think we got to worry about the British anymore, though, coming to get us. Plus, I don't think my AK-47 can stop a laser-guided drone missile. But, okay, that's in the Constitution. And then another side's going to go, take away all the guns. And then we've done that since 1996, and it's 2023. And you know what we've left our children? If you are under the age of 25 as an adult on my watch, I want to apologize to you that you have to be afraid to go to school. We're not talking about go to combat. We're talking about go to school. That our teachers don't make enough money as it is, and now we expect them to know hand-to-hand -hand combat, shooting, carrying guns, and parent kids who aren't parented at home. In a few years, we're not going to have teachers. They don't make enough money, and we don't give them enough support. And what do we do? We have the same tired arguments. Listen, I've been to Norway a few times. I have never seen a policeman with a gun. Our Christian friends in Norway go, what is wrong with you people? Guys, it's not funny, y'all. It's not funny. Like the rest of the world thinks, they, they go, what is your, how are you going to continue to let this happen? And the rhetoric is, well, these people have mental illness. And, and it's like, guys, I think it's time for us to admit there's something within our culture in America that we say, this is okay. Well, I want you to know, I don't think it's okay. I'm putting in, listen, every political chip I have with, politicians, I'm sending emails in, right, left, whoever, to say, y'all, we can't continue to do this. But I do know this. When organizations give politicians money on the right and on the left, it ain't for free. There's a word for that in the Old Testament. It's called bribery. I'm just saying. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve our church faithfully. And I want us to reach as many people as possible so that they can know Christ. And maybe one day some of these 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds will grow up with courage to say this ain't going to happen anymore and develop a way to stop it because we adults have proven that we won't want nothing to do with, with it. Yeah. And listen, guys, so a part of... Um, being a scholar and studying is I read and study all the time. So you can send all your articles. I'll just go, I read that argument. I've read that argument. There is no argument for love. Love sacrifices. I don't know, I don't know what it looks like, but I know we can't continue. And I know Jesus would go, where are my people? Verse 23, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Oh, notice that. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Isn't it interesting? I don't think the Apostle Paul knew about neuroplasticity. I don't think he knew that the way you think changes the grooves in your mind. But isn't it great to know that God knows all things? The scene of the crime is your That's why we got to fill our minds with gospel truth. 24, put on your new nature. 
I'm going to talk more about what that means when we come to Christ. And here's God's will for your life. Here's God's dream for your life and my life. Put on your new nature. Create it to be like God. That doesn't mean we become a God. It means to reflect his character, his love, his mercy, his truth, his goodness, which is truly righteous and holy. What's interesting about this word, righteousness, it's in a cluster of words in the New Testament that simply mean justice. If you want to know what justice means, it means this, righting wrongs treating people the way you want to be treated. It means sacrificial love. It means caring about things that don't affect you, but affect others. And the word holy means you are set apart for God's purposes. In other words, we are in tune to another radio frequency called grace. We are part of another colony called the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is on a holy quest of love. In his nail-pierced hands is grace. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, I want you to be fully alive. This Lent season, be fully alive in the resurrection life of Christ. But here's a problem, though. Sin is a roadblock. The Greek word harmatia, sin is a roadblock. Can can I give you an illustration? So... um, Brigham Young, where I played ball at, uh, had an alumni game. And so uh, I was going to go play. Well, actually, I wasn't going to play because my wife was like, boy, if you get hurt on that field, you're going to get hurt when you get home. (laughs) So I was just going to show up and wave to the peoples. But anyway, our flight had mechanical issues, so I couldn't go. It was a roadblock. And then Utah has been having so much snow, like record snow, that the flight got canceled again because of snow, so I wouldn't be able to make it back. Well, it's a roadblock. Well, when you and I walk in sin, it is a roadblock to what God wants to accomplish in our lives. Ooh, I hate when the Holy Spirit does this, but right now, Your wife feels so distant from you, and you know at the office you're having an inappropriate relationship. It hadn't got physical yet, but it's turning into emotional adultery, and you know it. Stop. We don't need to psychoanalyze it. We don't need to talk about your childhood. Stop. No one ends up in an affair like, I just woke up in a hotel with this strange woman. No, no, no. It's it's a long journey of decisions. Stop today. I've said this for a decade. When your old boyfriend and your old girlfriend hit you up on Facebook, how you doing? This is how I'm doing. Delete. And we don't need to meet because you just got delete. Hey, guys. I've been doing this a while now. If I could tell you how many marriages have gotten ruined by, it's just an old boyfriend, old girlfriend. You don't think the devil knows when you feel tender or weak? When there's distance, that's when you press in. So so sin means to miss the true purpose of our lives, which is bringing God glory. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, listen to this. Um, What does sin do? Um, It hurts people. We hurt each other. First thing first, if you're a human being of any age, you have been hurt because of someone else's sin. And some of us have been hurt worse than others. Some of us have gone through some incredibly painful, painful things. Some of us have been hurt really, really deeply. I don't want to minimize that, but please be careful. Do not turn your hurt into the only hurt there is. Don't make your hurt greater than someone else's hurt. Because when you do, your hurt will become your obsession and your idol. And whatever we idolize is 
destroys us. And please be careful about trauma bonding with other people in hurt. And what happens is, is you create this cyclone of I'm hurt, you're hurt, I'm hurt, you're hurt. And then everybody becomes the enemy. And the enemy loves that. Here's something that's really important. Why don't we talk about the people we've hurt though? We typically, well, you did this to me, you did this to me, you did this. Well, what about what we done did? But here's what's great about God's grace. God's grace can break the cycle of hurt. Here's what God's grace can do. It will make you not a victim, but make you victorious. Some of you have been to hell and back, but I want you to know you don't have to stay in hell because the God of heaven will take what was sent to break you and he will make you. Now understand this, understand this. I am preaching from scripture, but I am preaching from my real life. My sexual abuse is not my tattoo. The cross is my tattoo. My neglect is not my boundary marker. The one who rose from the dead, I will, oh, no, 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 no. The day that I came to Jesus and the day you came to Jesus, a poster was put in your yard and it says, a victim does not live here. Christ in you is greater. Now listen, we have a culture that makes money telling you to stay messed up. We have a whole culture, a whole internet base every week. Let me tell you how messed up you, you, you are. Well, let me tell you how great Jesus is. He's greater than how messed up you and I are. He's greater than the pain that was afflicted to us. And for those of you going, well, does he understand? Not only does he understand, but you don't understand. Take your pain and the trillions of people that have always existed. He felt it on the cross and he didn't back down. He didn't come off the cross. He stayed up on the cross because he wanted to raise you up with his resurrection. It destroys us with shame, guilt, and low self-esteem. Shame and guilt and low self-esteem um, can lead to mental illness. Listen to this. This is from Dr. Mark Winwood, clinical lead for mental health services at Axia Health. It says, excessive irrational, excessive irrational guilt has been linked to mental illness such as anxiety, depression, dysphoria, feelings of constant dissatisfaction, and obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. It can cause sufferers to believe they are a burden to their loved ones and those around them. Unchecked guilt can also result in flagging concentration and productivity, low mood, increased stress, and lack of sleep. As a result, our relationships, daily actions, overall outlook on life can be badly affected. So, first things first. The moment you said yes to Jesus, you were instantly forgiven. When you said yes to Jesus, listen, when you said yes to Jesus, he took not only our sin, but our guilt and our shame, and he buried them in the sea of God's forgotten memory. Any guilt or shame that you feel and you're in Christ is not from Christ. The greatest tool that the dark powers of evil have against us is for us to believe a lie. When you go back to the Garden of Eden, Satan did not pull the apple down and throw it into Eve's mouth. This is what he did. Did God really say? That's all he has is to make you doubt you're forgiven, to make you doubt you are loved, to make you doubt that you are pure, to make you doubt that you are righteous. And here's what's so hard for us to believe it. We don't deserve any of those things. That's why it's called grace, precious one. Grace says, I do for you what you cannot possibly ever do. And I do it out of love. And lastly, sin hinders the mission of Jesus. Sin hinders the mission of 
Jesus. Now, let me pause here. This is really important, and I'm starting to see this more and more and more. Uh, I'm going to teach you a German word here, okay? It's called Zeitgeist, and it means the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age means what's the popular thing to say now? So the popular thing to say now is this. Man, the church is all full of hypocrites. Man, the church doesn't do nothing. Man, the church, church, church. And I just want to take a step back and say, I'm sorry for the way you've been hurt, but have you been to all 400,000 churches in North America? Do you know all couple hundred millions of Christians? That's a pretty arrogant thing to say, the church. How about, about this? There were some people that were a part of a church that I got hurt at. Versus the church. Well, the church don't do nothing except for have free grocery stores, except for have homeless shelters, except for uh, like Saddleback Church basically ending the AIDS crisis in Rwanda because of what they did. I went to an event with Pastor Rick Warren, and I saw one of the leading atheist scientists who's over uh, immunology and AIDS say, I never thought the church could make a difference in this fight until I met Rick Warren in Saddleback Church. Saddleback Church began to turn churches into medical units throughout Rwanda, basically eradicating it. So let's not get with the spirit of the age and, well, the church is this, the church. Well, no, no, no. God has done a lot of great things, and there are more people who are beautiful and loving and kind. So be careful with the church. And besides, what, what did you do? Do you hold yourself to the same scrutiny? One of the ways if you know you're being authentic is you hold yourself to the same standard by which you judge other people. <laughs> so family, in this Lent season, how do we turn? How do we overcome sin? Don't try, rely. Don't try, rely on the grace of King Jesus. So let me give you the backdrop. This is Romans chapter six, verse one. In Romans chapter five, the apostle Paul just goes ballistic, man. He is telling the Jews and Gentiles like, look, the blood of Jesus makes us righteous. The blood of Jesus gives us life. The blood of Jesus is forgiving, he's loving, he's all these wonderful things. And you know what the response was? It's the same response that you and I give. We go, so if all that's true, does that mean I can do whatever I want to do? I can continue to sin? And Paul's like, no, you're missing it. Why would you want to when you've been loved this way? So I was in a coffee shop and... Um, I got like routines, and I don't like for people to mess up my routine. Uh, I get cranky. That's what old people get cranky. We wear sweaters because we're cold all the time, and we get cranky. <laughs> and so, uh, so, so, so I'm in a coffee shop, and I'm going through the me message, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to jump and shout and scream. This is ministering to me so much, but I don't want to scare the white people, the black <laughs> The black people and Latinos would be like, oh, he's just praising, don't know where about him. Hey, what's the white people? Are like, hey, what's going on around here? Is he okay? <laughs> Call 911. Call 911. Negro, Negro alert. 911. Okay, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to do, do, do that, right? I, I just, so, so I sat there, I sat there, right? And, and, and I was thinking about the grace of God. I was thinking about the grace of God. And so I'll be 52 next week. And as I was thinking about the grace of God, I thought about this 26 year old, scared, immature, frightened, insecure, broken little boy. And I was like, gosh, Lord, you've brought him a long way. I was like, oh my goodness, God, you have brought him. And I'm not talking about on a stage. I'm talking about the capacity to forgive myself. I'm talking about the capacity to be merciful to people who didn't deserve it. I'm talking about the capacity to forgive others. I'm talking about the capacity to love my wife and to be a dad. And I'm going, God, your grace is so amazing. Why would I ever want to turn my back on you when you turned your face towards me? Now, family, listen, though. That's not just for me. That's just for you. But the question is, do you think about his grace? 
You think more about what you haven't done than what he's done. You think about how you failed more than he succeeded. In other words, hear my heart. Get your eyes off of yourself. You're not that important. He is. That's why you're stuck. I can tell now. So I've been doing this now. Oh, Lord, this is going on 25 years now. So I got a little skin in the game. I can tell when someone is ready to be transformed. And here's how. We begin to talk. And if I hear, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to stop this, I go, oh, they ain't ready. You're, you're too confident in yourself. Man, I will never do that. Now you better say, because of God's grace, he will empower me not to do that. You see, God's grace is Jesus coming to us with a love that will never abandon us. God's grace is Jesus coming to us with forgiveness in his nail-pierced hands. God's grace is Jesus coming to us and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm gonna live in you. I'm gonna live through you. I'm gonna be the glory of God. Just let me. Friends, if you have a bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot, could you immediately take it off? That is the worst theology in the history of the world. God don't need a co-pilot. He created the universe. He created the atoms that hold it together. He created the chambers in your heart that beats. He's the one who rose from the dead. He's the one who defeated sin, death, and evil. We don't need to live for him. We need him to live in us. But he only lives through weaklings. So if you think you're tough and you got it all, he can't help you. But if you're like, all right, Lord. He goes, okay, I can work with that. I try to tell people this, and just to bear my testimony, I am a compulsive stutterer. It is comical that I preach literally around the world. And here's why. Because I know the very second I stop asking for his strength, I'm going to be up here speaking in tongues. <laughs> Not literally with a twisted tongue, that every word, every thought, I have to have him to do it. So listen, he can and will do it. Yeah. Okay, so, so family, how do we overcome sin? Don't try, rely. Now, this section, I want to talk specifically for those of you who are seniors in high school getting ready to go to college, okay? Right now, you have no idea how much your parents or whoever's over you in authority loves you and protects you. You're going to get to college. Ain't nobody going to wake you up. You can turn the alarm off. You can decide to study. You can decide to go to the club. You can decide who you hang out with. And here's what's going to take place. Sin is going to look so attractive that if you're not rooted in Christ, you're going to try not to do it and do it worse than you ever thought you could. So you want to make sure you are rooted in who you are in Christ. So we don't try, we rely, rely on your baptism into King Jesus. This sounds ethereal, so, so let me make it very, very practical here. Um, can you guys bring out my uh, element? I think I got something coming. Oh, there you go. Can we thank this young muscular man here? There you go. There you go. I don't know if he's singles, ladies, but I'm just saying he's kind of built. All right. We build him strong here at TC. Cornbread fed. Strong in the body and soul. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Second service, man. All right. Okay. So, let's say, for instance, we were in the first century, um, let's say we're in Athens, Athens, Greece. 
let's say I'm your tailor, which would never happen because I'm not artistic like that, but let's just say I was, and you came to me and said, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Maximus Grayus, uh, Maximus Grayus, uh, I have a wedding to go to and the colors are red, so I need you to take the cloth and I need you to make it red. And I would say, okay, for two, for one denarii, I'll do it for you, I'll have it by the end of the week. So what I would do is I would take the cloth and I would, you ready? Baptize it. The word baptizo simply means to submerge. So what I would do is I would baptize, I would submerge the white cloth into the red dye. I mean, I let it get in there good, you know, because we want it it to be red. Lady in red (laughs) is dancing with me, cheek to cheek. Hey, y'all, that didn't do nothing for you, but that done something for Vicky. I'm telling y'all that now. (laughs) Hey, we've been married a long time. I know what I'm doing up here, young fellas. Take notes! So, okay, so, so I baptize it. I submerge it in. You know what's happening? Is the dye is getting into the cloth. So it goes in one color, but then it comes out the color of the dye. It's been baptized. Well, the early Christians said, guess what? We too have been dipped into someone. And the someone that we've been dipped into is named Jesus. And his blood is a red blood. It's a blood that forgives. It's a blood that breaks chains. It's a, it's a blood that makes you alive. It's a blood that gives you a whole new identity. It is a blood that you get dipped into, and when you come back out, you are fundamentally different. Now, here's the part that's difficult. As you go, but pastor, I don't feel different. Hear your pastor's heart. What Jesus did for you is greater than what you feel. Many of us in this current last 30 years have been raised to determine truth by what we feel. Feelings don't determine truth. I could feel, and I've been saying this for 13 years, I could feel like I'm a fried taco. If you affirmed that I'm a fried taco, you're not only lying to me, but you're helping me be dysfunctional and you're running into reality. None of that is good. Here's the truth. When Jesus of Nazareth, born of the Virgin Mary, who hails from eternity, put on human flesh, for 33 years he fulfilled the Torah, the Ten Commandments, because Derwin couldn't, because you couldn't, because we couldn't, because the world couldn't, and he said, Dad, I fulfilled the Torah. And then when he went to the cross, Those of us who have faith with him died with him on the cross, was placed in the tomb with him for three days. But early on Sunday morning, when the tomb began to shake, he rose from the dead and he says, you now live in me regardless of how you feel. This is what I got to do to myself. You ready? When I'm struggling, and by the way, I do struggle. Please don't think my wife and I have it all together. One of the things that we found is people will suck life out of us because they think we got it together. We're like, wait a minute. We got parents in in their 70s. We got adult kids. We got health issues. So please don't think people got it all. Just because I preach on the stage doesn't mean I got it together. Like, I'm I'm living off the same gospel you are. So, 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 So he now lives in us, and I have to get 
when I'm struggling, I have to, I have to go, Derwin, are your feelings true or is Jesus a liar? We know the answer to that. Jesus don't lie. So I have to put my mind on the truth, and guess what my feelings do? But what we want to do in our culture is we go, truth is here, and we go, well, I feel this way. And guys, truth ain't going to run after you. Truth says, believe. And then you know what you need? Is you need brothers and sisters who don't tell you toxic positivity. You're enough. You can do it. No, no, you need pe people to go, Jesus is enough. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your holiness. Jesus is your forgiveness. The power of the Spirit lives in you. And they grab you by the arm and they carry you. They carry you. They carry you. I remember 1998, we're playing, uh, no, seven, 97, we're playing New England. I had just come to faith and I had done something stupid and I was filled with guilt and somebody gave me a book by this guy named Max Lucado. And so I was reading it on the plane after the game. Now keep this in mind, played an NFL game on the team plane, going back and I'm feeling guilty. And as I was reading about Max Lucado, he's talking about grace and mercy and forgiveness. And I went to my teammate, his name was Ray McElroy. And I used to make fun of Ray McElroy because he used to read his Bible before practice and I would slap it out of his hand and go, you're a Mormon, then I'd run away. And so anyway, so I get... I get, I get saved, and, and I'm like, Ray, it says that, that God forgave all my sins even before I committed. Is that true? He's like, get him, Max, get him. I'm like, oh, what about this mercy? Is that? He's like, oh, get him, Max. That's the kind of friends you need. You need gospel friends around you to point you to what's true. You don't need people around you going, yeah, they did you wrong, girl. You know what, man, dude, they did you wrong. They did you wrong. What's going to fill your mind? How about this? They did do you wrong, but we did Jesus wrong. But Jesus did us right. Wow. <laughs> All right. Let's cadaddle. Romans 6, 2 through 5. Absolutely not. How can we who've died still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into his death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Here we go. So we too may walk in newness of life. This is a little technical, but I got to give it to you. Check this out now. The way that's written in the Greek language is called the eris active subjunctive. You're like, pastor, what does that mean? It means this. It's an expectation. It's an expectation, like, now that you've received grace, believe it and walk in what's true. The only thing the devil has on us is to get us to believe a lie. For if we've been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans 13, 14 in the NIV. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's so simple, isn't it? Like, we make it very complicated. So case in point, this morning, I got up, told my sweet lover, good morning. Actually, I was like, how you doing? I said, how you doing? We had a force field of breath that collided, created a black hole in the universe. So I was like, you know what? It's still a little chilly out. So I'm going to put on my little coat here. I made a choice to put it on. So when you and I wake up, we open with prayer and we put on Christ. We wear his mercy. We wear his grace. We wear his truth. We wear his kindness. We wear his courage why? So when the attacks come, we don't have to scramble to put it on. We already wearing it. Listen, guys. I know often in American Christianity, what we want is a problem solver. And Jesus is looking for people to worship. Because what we worship, we become like.
In this Lenten season, teenagers, how do we overcome sin? Don't try, rely on the death and resurrection life of King Jesus. Paul just continues here, man. He goes, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to it. All this verse is saying is the life that you and I were born with has been executed with Christ and we are no longer slaves to the power of sin. We now have a choice. Uh, this was probably back in 2005, and by this time, Vicky and I had developed a rule. Never have an argument when you're tired, okay? It's a disaster every time. There are ways to have an argument that's life-giving and helpful and honoring. When you're tired, you don't do that. So I forget what we were arguing about. We were tired. We broke the rule. And, man, and, and this has happened maybe once or twice in our entire marriage. We were yelling. We were screaming. Presley at that time was maybe nine or eight, and Jeremiah was like four, some four or five. And we were just going at it. Like, I knew. The Holy Spirit said, stop, stop, stop. Nope. <laughs> nope. And I would suggest probably for her too, you got to ask her about it. But man, we were yelling. And the next thing I knew, Presley was holding Jeremiah in the kitchen and they were both crying and Presley was telling us to stop. And then we snapped back into reality. I'll speak for me. My selfishness of choosing not to walk in the power of the spirit hurt my wife and my children. It didn't have to be that way. You and I don't have to do it anymore. Sin has been rendered powerless if we put on Christ and just keep him on. So now what we've learned to do is Vicky Vic, will go, you know what? Why don't we wait a little bit? I'm tired. You're tired. And we go, okay, yeah. That doesn't mean it's easy. Following Jesus is not easy. The cross is not easy, fam. But his grace is great. Since a person who has died is freed from sin, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So Paul is re-summarizing that again. What he's saying when you and I said yes to Jesus, our lives are inextricably forever died or tied to him. We are tied to him when he died. He lives again. He lives in us. Verse 11, this changed my life. So, whenever you see so in the Bible, know something good is about to happen. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's how this changed my life. This, this word right here, consider, is an accounting term that accountants would use in the ancient world. So two plus two equals four, period. I may not like it, but it's true. You may not always feel like you're alive in Christ but it's true you may not always feel loved in Christ but it's true you may not always feel that it's going to work out but he rose from the dead and he works all things together for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose hear my heart in this Truth is independent of Derwin's feelings. Christ rose from the dead. Single mamas, you're going to make it. Christ rose from the dead. Single dads, you're going to make it. Christ rose from the dead. Those of you in the midst of addiction, you're going to break free. Christ rose from the dead. Those of you in marriages that are hanging on by dental floss, you're going to make it. Christ 
rose from the dead. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world and it is true and always has been true. Call on his name. This is what's going to happen next, fam. Our worship team is going to come out and they're going to lead us in two songs. And we're doing this because we want the word of God and the word saying to collide in our souls. And after that, I'm going to come back out. I'm going to lead us in prayer. We're going to receive our offering. And then we're going to go into the world and our chains are going to fall off. We're going to be free.